Hi everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar on my role in tackling health inequalities, uh, a framework for allied health professionals. Um, my name is Linda Hindle and I am one of the Deputy Chief Allied Health Professions Officers uh, based in um, Public Health England. And we're joined today by some excellent speakers. So we've got um, Dr John Ford, who is a clinical lecturer in public health at the primary care unit at the University of Cambridge, and also Professor um, Dirk Dougal, who is a senior consultant in leadership and organisational development, and the driving force between um, behind the kind of population healthcare movement at the uh, King's Fund. And then we also have Dr Marina Sultan, who is the Policy and Delivery Lead at NHS England and Improvements Health Inequalities um, Directorate. Um, she has many other roles, um, but that's, that, that's the capacity in which she is. Uh, she joined us today. And we're also being supported behind the scenes by uh, Stephanie Gates, um, Magatou Margate and um, Kelly Hullhouse. So thank you uh, very much to them. So just to set the context for this before I hand over to our speakers, um, many of you will know um, that we have been on a journey over the, um, uh, the last seven years or so to embed public health and prevention into um, the work that we do as allied health professionals. And we've made some really uh, significant progress uh, in that space. And tackling health inequalities or reducing health inequalities has always been uh, part of this agenda. But I think the the clear disparities that we've seen in the impact of um, of the pandemic has really shone a light on uh, on the need to do more, and it's created um, an enthusiasm amongst um, the the community of allied health professionals to want to do uh, more in this space. It's also raised the question about what is the impact that we that we have already and where are the opportunities for us um, to do more. Um, so, um, so one of the things that John is going to be talking about is the evidence review that he's done to look at where where we're already having an impact and where we can do more. But I think the thing with health inequalities, it's one of those um, areas that that can seem so big and unwieldy that it's very difficult to know where our own personal uh, contribution can be and, and it can often lead us to think that it's outside of our control and it's the role of someone else um, and that's what led us to do uh, the piece of work with the king's fund to try and describe what health inequalities actually means in the context of of our practice as ahps wherever we work and, and that's what dirk is going to uh, to talk to us about um, so we want to help you to think about health inequalities in the context of your own clinical, professional and personal context. Um, so I'm going to hand over to those um, colleagues in a moment, but just to um, let you know that Marina um, is, is she's not speaking, but she is going to join us in the panel Q&A uh, conversation um, after after the presentations. So Margaret, if you just move on to the uh, the next slide, please. Um, just to say that um, we're really keen for as many questions as um, as possible. So please add your questions um, as we go through the presentation. As is usually the case in in these um, webinars, we'll we'll come to the Q and A at the end rather than after um, each presentation. And if there are questions that come up and you can see them and you think, well, I really I really like uh, to hear the answer to that question, just add a like, and we'll um, we'll make sure that those ones that have got the most likes are the ones that we. Um, that we cover first. So um, we're, we're just to let you know that we are recording this um, this presentation because we know that a lot of HPs want to hear it but can't make today uh, and so we'll make that available on the Futures platform afterwards. So without further ado I am going to um, introduce you to uh, to John so that he can uh, share the work that he did on the uh, on the evidence review. So thank you John. Hi, thanks, Linda. Uh, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and presenting this work. So I'm a clinical lecturer in public health um, at the University of Cambridge. I split my time between the University of Cambridge and um, um, Public Health England, the East of England team. Um, so half my time um, is spent in research where I have a programme of uh, research around health inequalities and the rest of my time is um, doing public health with PHE. Um, today I'm going to present this uh, raft review which we did around the impact of allied health professionals on 
inequalities. I'm going to focus, uh, spend a, a reasonable chunk of time um, talking about our approach to inequalities and how we impact the problem. Uh, I won't spend so much time on the methods and then describe the, the, the findings. The full report is publicly available on our website if you want uh, to have all the, all the detail. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to have a quick acknowledgement of um, all the other authors who've been involved in this work. Um, there's a big team of us, um, both academics and, and um, allied health professionals involved in it. So the next slide then goes through some of the background to the problem. So I think we can all um, understand what we mean by health inequalities in terms of the broad definition, which tends to be um, avoidable and unfair differences between or within groups or across a gradient. Um, and as Linda says, we know that um, the pandemic has um, has compounded these pre-existing inequalities. And actually, we've probably just seen the tip of the iceberg at the minute. I suspect that um, in the next few years, we'll see um, more and more of the true impact that the pandemic's had on both health, um, care and health outcome inequalities. We also know that AHPs make up a large proportion of the NHS workforce, both in terms of contact and in terms of number of staff. Um, and from previous research, we know that um, HPs are, are really keen to do their bit to address inequalities. Um, and part of this review is to, um, is to try and unpack um, what impact allied health professionals are having and what impact they can have. Um, so the next slide shows the overarching question which we um, were trying to tackle, what is the impact of allied health professionals and health inequalities, uh, which is a great question to try and tackle. Um, part of the process was then unpacking this question. Um, and to unpack that question, if we go to the next slide, we'll show you a, a framework which um, our group has developed around health inequalities. And this tries to unpack health inequalities to make it more manageable and chunk it up a bit. So it separates out health care inequalities and health outcome inequalities. With health care inequalities being able to um, unpack across a patient pathway, so here we've kind of described risk factors, access, diagnosis, experience. But actually, this could be across um, any patient pathway and could include other things as well, things like screening. There's also healthcare inequalities across systems in terms of uh, funding and workforce inequalities. Um, and um, we know that these healthcare inequalities are inequalities in their own right, but they also indirectly impact on health outcome inequalities. So those are the inequalities in things like um, life expectancy, premature mortality, and also morbidity in terms of things like mental health. Um, but we also know that these, these health outcome inequalities are also driven by the social determinants of health, these things like income and wealth and um, resources, power, education, employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we can unpack the different components of health care and health outcome inequalities. And we can think across across three main groups. So the socioeconomic gradient, so that's kind of rich and poor or um, deprivation or wealth or income, those kind of factors. We can think about specific disadvantaged groups in terms of minority ethnic groups, sexual minorities, rurality. We can add in others, particularly think about multiple disadvantage, not just um, saying that if someone belongs um, or identifies as LGBTQ+, plus, that they are um, necessarily vulnerable to poor health outcomes, but actually they, they face disadvantage in, in society, and particularly when, when, when we have multiple aspects of disadvantage. Um, and then um, thirdly, all these inclusion health groups. So these are groups who, by their life circumstances, are, are, dis um, are vulnerable to poor health outcomes. So it might be people who are homeless, um, or people who are undocumented migrants or, or with learning disabilities, and there's other groups as well. And we also acknowledge that actually there's different levels in which we can um, uh, think about health inequalities in terms of the national picture, where the inequalities across the country, but we could also think about inequalities within the region, so that might be across, for example, the east of England. Uh, we can look at inequalities within a system, so that might be within um, Greater Manchester, um, for example, or we can think about um, um, inequalities within an organisation. So that may be within a trust, with a primary care network, within a GP practice. Um, and then we can think about inequalities at, the, at an individual level. So how do we, uh, um, as um, health professionals, interact with individual patients? So trying to unpack it in these two different dimensions, 
to try and um, understand um, health inequalities great uh, better. So if we go to the next slide, um, part of the challenge um, with navigating the literature um, was is is trying to pin down this um, all these different inequalities. So if we look at um, uh, just for studies which look at the gap and the gap between two groups. So between, for example, um, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups and non socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, then there's very few studies and we knew that uh, from the start. But actually, if we start reconceptualizing the problem and thinking about, well, how about if we think about um, um, how allied health professionals can help disadvantaged or inclusion health groups? How about uh, thinking about um, supporting the unequal distribution of the social determinants of health? How we think about transferable evidence? So, you know, even if there's if there's um, not evidence directly um, um, relating to allied health professionals, what about primary care and about um, or um, GPs or um, nurses or um, specific secondary care specialties? Can, is there transferable evidence that we could that we could logically and um, reasonably apply to to allied health professionals? So that led us to the next slide, which is uh, our uh, four main questions. Um, three of them relate to allied health professionals. So uh, the first one looks at this gap problem. How can AHPs uh, decrease or increase the, um, um, the inequality gap? Secondly, around the social determinants of health and the unequal distribution of them. Thirdly, around how to help disadvantaged groups, and that's both disadvantaged and inclusion health groups um, in relation to our discussion earlier. And then finally, around, well, what can we learn from non-AHP settings as well? So the next slide then shows that um, the methods of the, we, we undertook two literature reviews, um, which is on the next slide. So the first part, um, was um, one literature review which looked at the allied health professional literature, the fairly traditional review. The things just to highlight is we focus particularly on um, review, uh, systematic reviews. Um, so it was a kind of review of reviews and we looked at the past 10 years. And then if we go on to the next slide, that's, we did a second review and that was looking at uh, non allied health professional settings uh, where we focused just in the past five years but we did a broader search uh, for, for for reviews. Um, so next slide, I'll just go on to the, the findings. So the findings from stage one. So this is the allied health professionals um, evidence. Um, if you go on to the next slide, we'll see that um, we started off with um, screening about just under 9000 articles and we ended up with 36 reviews included in it. Um, and um, the next slide shows the, the main findings. Um, so I've separated these into blue and green. Blue um, factors come from um, the allied health professionals um, studies. Green factors come from non-allied health professional um, studies. I'll just um, quickly go through each component. So looking at patient or organizational level factors of how HPs can influence inequalities. So there's a, a bit of literature around access um, and we talked about helping those who needed the most. Um, and these are things like improving um, access to allied health professional services uh, for, for example, pe people in low incomes or people with serious mental illnesses or people are with rural um, and living in rural areas or with transport problems. And also helping access for specific groups. So helping, um, for example, helping um, access to podiatry services for people with, who, who are homeless. Then there was another group of literature around the quality of care. And we've separated those um, into both the technical aspects of quality of care and um, the patient experience um, aspect of quality of care. Um, and we've titled that doing simple things well. Um, and so the technical aspects were things like dietitians helping um, people from minority ethnic groups um, achieving better HB uh, A1C results um, and improving kind of clinical markers. And then there was patient experience. So there's quite a lot of literature and things like reducing bias um, um, through AHP services and also about delivering uh, culturally competent services as well. Uh, thirdly, there was a group of literature around the social determinants of health. Um, 
And this was particularly relevant for certain groups, allied health professional groups. So, for example, occupational therapists and how occupational therapists can contribute to uh, people accessing um, housing and employment. But there was also lots of other um, groups as well, which can contribute to that, to helping people with the social determinants of health. Um, and then finally, um, there was a group of literature around, around mental well-being and helping people to have um, healthy um, healthy minds. And so this may be things like um, art and music therapy for people with um, severe mental health problems or um, rehabilitation post-stroke um, to help people with, with depression. So those were the patient organisation level. There's more detail in the report if you, if you, if you want it. In terms of the system level, um, the literature, um, allied health professional literature picked up two particular things, one around guidance um, and specifically that was around how we um, ensure that guidance reflects um, the diversity of communities. So that could be um, uh, that could be around sexual minorities or ethnicity and also ensuring the workforce is distributed equally um, and, and fairly um, um, proportionate to need. Um, so those were the the main results for the AHP literature. If we go on to the, the next slide, um, I'll just quickly add on the, the, the literature um, or the evidence from the non AHP settings. So the next slide shows how many studies we got from that. So again, we, we screened um, about 1,600. We ended up with 29 studies. Full details are in our report if you want to have a look at them. You go to the next slide and I'll just pick up um, um, so in addition to what we found, we also found um, what we thought was transferable evidence around funding. Um, so particularly thinking about um, how funding is allocated across NHS organisations. And there is evidence that when funding is allocated proportionate to, uh, to deprivation, that um, health inequalities are re reduced. And um, uh, we argue that that's also applicable to allied health professionals and also the importance of community engagement and power. It's not something which 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 came up much in the allied health professionals literature or certainly the reviews that we, we included, but it came up strongly in the non HP uh, literature. And I think there is the, there is a more specific HP literature which speaks to this problem, but um, it wasn't covered in the systematic reviews which we included. But actually the importance of working with communities both in terms of um, engagement and empowerment and ensuring that they have an active voice in the in the design and delivery of services. Um, so finally, um, if we move on to the conclusion slide. Um, so while we while we didn't find much um, evidence in literature looking at the um, how allied health professionals can can narrow a, a gap between two groups, actually we found a real uh, huge wealth of evidence around the impact they have in terms of uh, supporting disadvantaged and um, inclusion health groups in terms of access, quality, mental health um, and the social determinants of health. Um, and we also found the importance of um, ensuring equitable guidance, funding uh, and workforce. Um, and so while, um, and, and so actually, I guess, um, um, oh, there was a real sense that actually HPs have so much impact in terms of all these different components um, and across the different levels. Um, so on that note, I'll finish my presentation and I'll hand over to Durka for the um, for the framework. Thank you, John, um, and also to Linda for the really warm welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you today. So we've heard from John already, the literature says the power, the impact, the passion of AHPs in delivering this agenda is already evident. So my job is relatively easy um, in terms of then talking through our framework. So if we go to my slide set, please. Um, so next slide, that's it. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about population health um, and the context of this work, why it's so important. So a bit of a helicopter view before I then dive into the framework itself. Um, hopefully it'll be a helpful overview and a sense of the landscape in which I think these efforts are taking place and why they are just so important. Um, and also helpful, hopefully for you in terms of putting some sort of context to the framework more widely. 
So I'm Durka, I'm a Senior Consultant and Programme Director at the King's Fund and I am a uh, I am a medical consultant by background, I'm a public health specialist and I guess I lead a lot of the work in terms of population health at the fund. I'm absolutely passionate about people, people like you um, and colleagues across health and care um, in really making a difference to practice because I think that's where the power lies. So you could say my focus is on turning policy and aspirations into practice and that's what I've been trying to support um, organisations, individuals across the UK and beyond over the last few years. Why is it important? Well, I think that the key thing, so a couple of slides on, on this, is that the health and care landscape is changing and in a really healthy way in many ways. Much has been achieved and I think there are strides forwards in terms of our understanding. So we are now recognising that health is not a negative thing. It's not about ill health. You know that from your practice, but actually health is governed by so many things. And if you think about your own health, you'll, you'll know absolutely that's the case. So yes, the lifestyle choices that you make, but also who you live with, the communities, the networks, your living and working environment, your employment, your access to food and water, um, your housing and so much more. So there's something about recognising that and I think that's great. Next slide, please. And then we know that actually health care services only play one part of that health picture. There are so many people involved, therefore, so many organisations. Um, and actually, you could look at it that healthcare is a tiny bit of that, but it's an important bit and it's a bit that we know um, plays a big part in terms of influencing. So there's something about already thinking through you and your role when you're thinking about patients. Actually, how much do you think about health and not ill health? How much do you think about the holistic needs of the person? And I, I know that many of you are already thinking about this. That's why you're here today. Um, and therefore, who are the partners that can help with that? So next slide, please. We know the great things have been achieved. I think when we're in a landscape where things are tough and we're trying our best to make a difference, sometimes it's easy to forget just how much we're already doing great work, that you are already doing great work. And John's already reminded us of some of the impacts that you're having, um, but also some of the challenge that lies ahead um, in terms of the stalling life expectancy, health outcomes, uh, widening inequalities, and the need for more funding. And we know about the workforce challenges, and that was already even before COVID. I'm putting up a stark slide um, next, um, so the next slide, but just as a reminder um, that we know also that health and access to opportunities, access to support is not equally distributed. So we know that in terms of the inverse care law, we know that actually some of the most vulnerable people in society are often those who find it the hardest to access health and care. You know that from your practice. And I guess if we needed some facts and figures, these are some, there are so many, and these are things we knew already, even before COVID. So the social gradient that exists, I mean, John's mentioned all these, this is just producing some of the numbers to support it. We know that those living in the least deprived areas live longer and can expect to live longer than those in the most deprived areas. We know that that's true across the whole population and that health inequalities are experienced by everyone and not just those at the very bottom or the top. So we know, therefore, that we need already to think through how we approach caring for people and maybe disproportionately caring for people so that those who need more care and support get that more intense care and support. And maybe 10 minute appointment blocks aren't the right way. So maybe there's something about thinking through how do we fairly, unfairly distribute to actually meet the needs in the way that we need to address health inequalities. We know that um, looking at the healthy life expectancy, um, those in the least deprived areas can expect to live 19 more years in good health compared to those in more deprived areas. And those in more deprived areas can spend a third of their lives living in poor health. And that's almost double those in the least deprived areas. And we know that actually there's a lot that's avoidable, a lot that's modifiable. So when we think about risk factors, when we think about things we can do, we know that this is not things that are fixed but actually they're modifiable by actions that we can all take. 
And we know that there are particular ways that John's beautifully described, but there are particular ways that we can look at this lenses, particular groups maybe who we need to give more focus to, who are less heard, less served in our populations. Next slide, please. And I think it's safe to say that COVID has given us all a shove. Um, it, I've, I've heard it described as a, a burning platform, a window of opportunity. I don't like the war analogy. I think there's something about it has hit us all hard as individuals, as caregivers, as families, communities. We've been through a huge amount. We've lost a huge amount, but we've learned a huge amount as well. And it has created a momentum. Um, the most recent and most stark of, of the stark you know, things that we already knew um, is probably the Build Back Fairer report um, where it talks about in the north 25% um, extra avoidable or, um, mortality um, linked to COVID compared to the rest of England. So as John says, inequalities exist, unfair and avoidable differences in people's health across populations and between groups. But the thing is, we know that we can make a difference and COVID in many ways, it has worsened the situation, but it has also shone a light onto things that we knew about for a very long time that have already existed. So it's also re-energised us and given us a real call for action. If not now, then when can we act on this? So there's something about this work is really timely. Next slide, please. So in terms of population health, therefore, three key things um, because it's core focus. If we look at the health and care landscape um, across integrated care systems, um, primary care networks in organisations, people get it. They get the need for focus on population health. So proactive care for the people that we care for, seeing the wide range of issues and thinking, what's my role in this and what can I do in collaboration with others? And then knowing that actually it's not evenly distributed, so inequalities exist. Next slide, please. So just flagging it, and I'm not going to go into depth, but there is a framework for population health, which is about improving health, but key is addressing inequalities um, and lenses that you might wish to take. Just flagging it in case anyone hasn't seen it and wants to read it. It's on our website. Next slide, please. And I guess the bulk of my work has been really going out and working with systems, thinking through how can we turn this into practice? So colleagues did a self-assessment. They used the framework and other things for areas like Greater Manchester. I'm not going to go into depth. So the next slides are just flagging things that you might want to look at in our website if you wanted more. Next slide, please. Then there's something about how do you go from projects to plans? So we've been supporting areas to think through strategies, um, including strategies for health inequalities across integrated care systems, primary care networks, organisations and individuals. And then the next slide, please. There are um, some examples flagged here in terms of strategies that you might want to look at and just think through, well, actually, if I were to do a strategy for my organisation, my team, my role, is this something I could use? Um, could I use it to think through health inequalities? Next slide, please. And then the work that we've been doing to help people understand the concepts in practice. The key thing here, though, so the next slide, please. Is across all of this, we began to realise that there are some amazing examples of work already taking place. Uh, we saw incredible things AHPs are already doing. So, for example, um, the top picture is our first ever cohort of Leadership for Population Health um, colleagues. And you'll spot in there an allied health professional there. Um, and the learning for us, the learning for across the leaders, um, as well as the individual there was amazing in terms of AHPs really are already making a difference. We know that from the things that John said. We know that already from the work in terms of the Royal Society of Public Health. Um, we know the statistics, uh, not only the client contacts, but just how trusted and valued you are. Um, so actually, the framework was one to learn about the work you're doing more and to help you learn about the work that others are doing to help celebrate some of this, 
because there is untapped work that I just think we could just already at the work shone a light on, but you could find out even more and shine even more. And then there's something about growing whatever role you're at um, in whatever level, whatever your background, there is room for you to really think through what can I do? So the next slide, please. So when we were invited to collaborate with Public Health England and NHS England and all four of the 14 allied health professional groups to develop a framework to help any allied health professional think through exactly that, we absolutely grabbed the opportunity. Um, worked with Linda Hindle, amazing Linda and her team, um, and really were struck by the power, the passion, and all, all you know, even just within trainees who actually led components of this work, the sheer potential that exists. So even if you're looking at this game, I'm new to my role, just look at the trainees who led some of this work and actually they really show just what's possible. So in terms of the data gathering, um, social media efforts, um, you've got such an amazing social media platform already and positive energy. Uh, the focus groups and then Dave and I, well, we were there to learn and combine this with some of our insights already from our population health work to create a framework. The framework's on the website, um, but essentially it's got six lenses that any of you will um, may choose to look at. Uh, don't worry that you might not want to look at all of them, but start somewhere. Um, and you see it's a pragmatic tool. It's not a technical tool to teach anyone about health inequalities. It references loads of links. But the key thing is it's for you to look at your own role and think through, well, what can I do um, to enhance awareness? take action and advocate for the people that I work with and serve. So I'll come on to that in a bit more depth in a second, um, but don't feel overwhelmed by it. Instead, see it as a way of chunking up um, your work um, and hopefully just edging it that bit further in terms of what can I do? How can I maximise my contribution? And also, how can I recognise the good work I do already and that of my team and organisation? It's one page, it's purposely simple, and like I say, it links to many things, including 50 plus examples of practice, which we found it was amazing the kind of things that we came up with. Every single one of the 14 allied health professional groups had examples across every one of those lenses, um, across every one of the awareness, action and advocacy. So have a look at those. Um, and if nothing else, it'll just make you, I think, be really impressed, fill you with a sense of there's so much work happening already. So it's a building job that needs to be done. Next slide, please. The framework itself, um, so the six lenses. Um, some of you might look at the bit about self and go self. That's an odd place to start. Um, but actually, in our leadership and organisational development work, it is the core of getting it right. There's something about just stopping and as clinicians, we, me included, um, often think, what can I do for others? Because there's so much I want to get right. But actually, there's something about stopping and going, actually, what's my story? What may be the biases that I hold? How much do I know already? Why am I passionate about health inequalities? What can I contribute? Then looking at patient care and thinking through what are the needs? So really understanding, taking the time to think through is the current way of doing it right? Or do we need to do something different to make it more fairly dispro disproportionate to meet the needs and not widen the inequalities? What are the holistic needs? So if I think about the individual in front of me and their health across all of those things, what do they really need? What really matters to them? Then there's something about the clinical teams and pathways and service um, groups that you work with. What can you do as a team? What are you already doing? What are your skills? What's your collective passion? Then look at the communities and networks that you're part of. Each of you will be connected into a variety of networks. You might hold a variety of different hats. So there's something about just looking at that as an asset. How can you utilise that? Then thinking through the systems that you work in. So the health and care system that you work in and just thinking how you can influence that. You might be already. How can you do more? And then thinking about the future. So to make this stick, we need to think about embedding this into the future, embedding it across practice, thinking about this new generation and way of working. What's needed? What are the skills? What are the resources? What's the mindset? What's the support? What is the leadership practice that we need to nurture? 
Next slide, please. So a couple of examples here, and I'm going to say at this stage, um, I carry a sense of guilt because across the 14 allied health professionals, we saw so many case examples. I would like to go through all of them. I just don't have the time. Um, and so there's a few that I've picked out just as a variety, but please don't think if your specialism isn't mentioned here that you're not important, you really are. So there's something about, uh, please have a look at all the examples um, and also think about the other examples that aren't there and just what more can be learned and shared. So let's look at the first one. Next slide, please. So the first thing, we look at awareness. So I've already talked about an occupational therapist who joined our program um, and in so doing managed to enhance their own awareness about population health and leadership practices, but also influence 26 other system leaders across UK, across health and care, some of whom didn't know about allied health professionals as much. They might have come from the charity sector or the councils um, or a whole host of other areas. And part of that program is learning about each other's sector because we don't always hold the understanding about other groups and other organisations. So there's something about them coming away with a sense of real amazement about what allied health professionals are already doing, um, as well as other groups. And then the other example um, is the amazing expanding of placement opportunities that are already happening to help new generations of trainees to really think through this in more, more depth across organisations. But it doesn't need to be a formal placement. There are resources. So in terms of awareness, you might just want to look at an explainer or a summary. We've linked them. You might want to have a conversation with a patient or a client group just to build your own awareness. You might just want to look at your local health and care system and just build a little bit more understanding about what's possible. Next slide, please. Nearly there in terms of my slides. I think there's a few more. So then there's something about action. So um, taking action. So there are many, many examples where, where you have been taking action in the most incredible ways. So we heard about um, an advanced paramedic in Blackpool creating a high intensity user programme to really think through tailoring care to address the mental health and social issues for that high service user need. It was so effective that they managed to get it scaled up to over 300 patients over three years and then saving money. So being able to show that that return on investment and now rolled out to one fifth of England. So that's an impressive scale. Um, and also for me, an impressive way of doing good work, but also capturing the impact of it and being able to share it and celebrate it and grow it. Then there's another example, um, which may be at a smaller scale, but you could argue for the patients and the families really, maybe equally impactful, if not more. So arts based interventions within a gallery space to promote mental health and well-being of parents and young people and through lockdown, making art boxes to actually carry on the good work at home. So thinking creatively in terms of how do we adapt this? The challenges of a situation may make it harder, but how do we keep reaching further? The next slide, please. In terms of advocacy, so actually, how do we not only do the good work of improving once we are aware about what's needed, but actually, how do we use that and influence others as well to change? And again, an overwhelming number of examples. I've only picked a couple because they're, they're topical, uh, but we've heard um, from systems complete redesign to individual pathways to changing to advocacy at another level. But two here, operating department practitioners at St George's, using their consultation insights with groups of people, for example, some Somaliland community, to then utilize that to influence how vaccine rollout was done so that there might be enhanced vaccine rollout for COVID-19. And um, I, I love this example. Um, I've shared it a few times just because it's really creative, um, but also just so impactful. Again, if you think about the group, so Forgotten Feet Clinics set up in 2013 by a podiatrist, uh, but it was based on the, the understanding, the learning that actually in our clinics, 
what people often wanted was a time to talk about serious issues and a connection outwards to other organisations. Um, so not only podiatry services, but utilising that opportunity to really think differently about linking in with wider systems. So now staff have been trained um, with the skills and the also resources to ask about wider issues, but then linking in with things like rape crisis centres, emergency shelters, local GPs, drugs and alcohol services, and using information to help change some of the understanding in those services as well and partnering for better care. Next slide, please. So, that's a whistle stop tour of the framework and also of the wider context. I hope it's helpful and I hope through that it stimulated you to think about your own role um, and maybe how you could use the framework. So do share the framework, test it out, let us know how it goes. Um, hopefully it's a tool for development, for conversation, growing and transforming the excellent work you're doing already further. Um, and a plug from me for every single one of the AHPs who have contributed. So over a thousand AHPs have contributed to this work. Um, I wish I could name you all, but you are a phenomenal group and it's been such an honour to do this piece of work. So over to you, Linda, for thank you from me. Thank you very much, Dirk, for your presentation and, uh, and to you, John, for yours. They were both um, amazing and it's it's um it's so good for us i think that um actually can you hear me oh good good that's good i just got an, a message to say that my my um microphone was muted even though it doesn't feel like it is that's good you can hear me um so yeah great great presentations and great your kind of advocacy for the ahp profession so so thank you and thanks everyone for popping um questions into the chat and, and for liking those we'll try and focus on the ones that have got the most uh, likes uh, first so to give john and dirk a rest i'm going to come to marina uh, first because marina we've got a question for you about um how all of this work links into the policies that are being developed in um, nhs england and improvement and how you're planning to support ahps further in in their contribution to health inequalities so firstly, thank you very much uh, to John Ford and Durka for such excellent presentations on what's being done in this space around um, engaging allied healthcare professionals when it comes to tackling health inequalities and understanding the role that we all um, can play when it comes to tackling health inequalities and especially allied healthcare professionals. Um, this really is relevant to the thinking at NHS uh, England and Improvement at the moment. We're in the process of setting up a multi education um, stakeholder group, which will include representation from all of our healthcare networks. So that includes allied healthcare professionals. And we are really looking at how do we bring all of our health and care workers from the different um, multidisciplinary team sectors to really feed in um, knowledge and understanding on the education and training fronts uh, when it comes to tackling health inequalities. We're also really interested in the research, so working with allied healthcare professionals to undertake more research um, to, to explore how we can uh, tackle um, health inequalities, specifically building up on the work that John Ford has presented today. And we really do welcome uh, any any further thoughts and comments into that uh, into that consultation process that will kick off over the coming weeks and months. Marina, thank you. Thank you very much. So leading on from, um, from, from your comments there about research, I'll, I'll come to John. Because uh, John, there's a few questions um, for you. And one is really, how can we um, continue to, to use research to keep our, our kind of moving forward in, in our efforts? And, and linked to that, were there any kind of particular research gaps that you think we ought to be focusing on? Uh, yeah, thanks. Great, great questions. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I think there's lots more that we could we could be doing. Um, I think really to to advance um, um, the agenda, there's two elements. One is, you know, I think we could be a lot more, a lot smarter about how we um, approach and understand inequalities. So instead of using health inequalities as a general catch-all term, actually getting a lot more specific about what we're trying to research and what we're trying to change. So is it 
socioeconomic inequalities in access to uh, dietitian services, for example, or is it um, um, inequalities in patient experience across ethnic groups um, for um, uh, occupational therapy services? So, so again, a lot more uh, smarter about uh, what inequalities we're uh, we're trying to identify, and then also identifying those guiding principles, those those broad principles which apply um, across multiple um, and multiple uh, different uh, groups. Um, in terms of gaps, uh, well, we yeah, there was lot there, there there was lots of potential gaps. So just to name, I, I'll I'll pick up a couple. Um, so uh, one thing was around workforce. So you know we we still don't have good data on um, and good research on the distribution of workforce um, and how allied health professionals are just distributed across the across the country. So for example, you, you look at um, art and music therapists. Um, you know, are, are they um, allocated? Uh, proportionally uh, to need across the across the country or not, don't know. Um, also, you know, I think um, thinking about um, uh, equity focus quality improvement as well. You know, lots of us um, are involved in quality improvement programs, whether within our teams um, or organisations. But actually, can we take an equity focus to those? Can we think about how a quality improvement is distributed across socioeconomic groups or across ethnicities? Um, so I think there's 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 lots um, still to do. It's essential for us that the workforce um, re is representative of the population that it serves. And for us to achieve that, we need to understand the distribution of our workforce, the challenges in different geographical areas, which as which members of our workforce um, experience. Uh, and we need to understand to what extent health inequalities have affected colleagues who've joined the workforce, as well as um, the extent to which um, we can use uh, different uh, groups within our professional bodies to minimise the gap. So what's really important for me to capture here in terms of messaging is that health inequalities, we recognise that this is something that is affecting our colleagues on a personal level. Um, it's not just something that, for example, is affecting our patients, but this is affecting very much our colleagues. And we need to understand the challenges from lived experience that our colleagues have encountered. Uh, and we need to look at how do we minimise health inequalities, both for patients and uh, for colleagues. Quite allied to this is um, uh, widening participation. So I've been involved previously within medical education and looking at schemes that widen participation to healthcare careers. And it would be really interesting, I think, uh, as part of the research questions going forward to look at um, the extent to which we could deploy something similar in the allied healthcare professional space. Um, and how is it that we do definitely ensure equitable representation across the country um, from our allied healthcare professional groups? Allied healthcare professionals are a significant and substantive part of our workforce. Uh, and for those who uh, are joining this call on, uh, and uh, who aren't necessarily frontline clinicians, we're talking really um, in terms of employment from an NHS point of view, from a contracts perspective, the NHS con contracts a lot more allied healthcare professionals than they do consultant clinicians and junior doctors are employed by Health Education England, so it's a slightly different body. So when we look at who's on the NHS payroll, um, allied healthcare professionals do constitute the vast majority uh, of the NHS payroll. So this is specifically really important um, from the perspective how we get this right. There's a lot that can be done um, in terms of looking at what allied healthcare professionals can do to add value to tackle health inequalities, but we also need to look at um, how how do we minimise health inequalities more broadly, as well as an understanding of the personal experience that colleagues joining us um, have on health inequalities from a personal and non-professional perspective, which I think is is really important here. Thank you, Marina. I think I think you'd um, you've partly answered a question that that Jen asked in the chat about how important it is that we've got a representative workforce of the of the population that we're that we're serving. So I'm going to kind of pull you in, Durka, if that's all right, to look at the second part of. I mean, you may want to comment on that, but also to second to look at the second part of uh, of Jen's question, which is. Um, how how do we reach um, communities who may be um, 
have been previously considered difficult to engage or we've not managed to reach. Um, but Jen's particularly asking that in the context of, of, of people who've perhaps had a, a difficult experience with the NHS, not felt properly engaged and therefore have got a mistrust uh, for clinicians. What, what actions do we need to be taking to, to overcome that? Thank you. Dirk has frozen, I um, I'm happy to come in on that question if, if Dirk has frozen. As, a, as an NHS yeah. frontline clinician, I can definitely say that from Forgive lived experience. Uh, so, as, uh, Linda. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, colleagues, we had a bit of an issue then with um, with Dirk freezing and then and then coming back in. So I know Dirk is back with us now, so I'll come back to you and then um, and then Marini can come back after if that's all right. Dirk. Brilliant. You. Apologies for that. I'm not sure what happened, um, but I, I would argue from a leadership practice, it is impossible to have a, a functional workforce that is not representative, um, because when you look at teams and the theories of teams, actually a diverse team is what it takes to really function well. Um, so it's not so one thing is getting the diversity right. And the second thing is actually then learning how to unlock some of the aspects of that diversity. So whether that, that's diversity, however you cut it, um, it, it is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we're working blind um, and it's a major risk. So, so there's something about that as, as a straight off. Um, in terms of representative of the population, uh, this is the one of the underpinning themes of uh, something called the anchor principles. There is a, a deep understanding that actually our workforce done right um, is actually part and parcel of that population. They're one and the same. Um, so there's something about seeing the workforce exactly as Marina has said in terms of a major asset um, in terms of population health, but also kind of about the lived experience. But uh, we've heard about kind of organisations looking at um, sofa surfing um, and poverty, the impacts of COVID even in their own workforce and bringing that in to re enrich their efforts with then wider population because the workforce being such a major asset. So you are a major asset and it's about enabling you and unlocking you to be able to do your job. And I think that's a critical factor. Uh, we've published a lot in terms of the culture that you need to get right for that compassionate leadership. But really, there's something about the power that you hold, um, but not, over, you know, there's something about then enabling that, not just expecting you to do it, but what's needed for you to do this work. Then the bit about the population, that's almost the, the kind of easy bit in a way. It's, it's not the easy bit, but it's almost a no brainer in that the answers to that lie in the community itself. Um, we cannot do this without engaging with the community. So if you look at Montefiore as one example in America, um, they realised that actually hospitals and GP practices need to break the walls and go into the communities and listen to communities, work with communities, sit with communities uh, to really hear what's going on, hear their lived experience and co-create solutions. If you look at the work of Wigan, um, of Nuka, um, up in Oldham, we've been doing some work. If you look at West Yorkshire and Harrogate across the country, um, people who are tackling health inequalities, that's an underpinning principle. Hope Citadel, again, um, the one in Oldham. So it's about really going out of the walls that you're in um, and hearing and listening and working with and seeing the agency of the people that you're working with. They've got the expertise. They know what's needed. It's about listening, learning and growing. Um, so I, I, I could delve into that much more, but I know that you've got other questions. I'm happy to dive back into some of the detail of that if anyone wants. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Dirk. Marina, I won't come back to you about that specific question, if that's all right, just in the interest of time, because we've only got six minutes left. But I will come back to you with um, with another question, which is um, which is kind of recognising the pressure on the workforce and how we frame this work in terms of doing better rather than doing more. 
Um, so it, it, I think from our point of view, it's really important that we appreciate that when we see patients in the clinical environment, we assess them based on how they present in the clinical environment. And one of the key things that's missing at the moment is an understanding of the environment from which the patient came. That's not something that we capture very well at the moment. And I'm leading a national piece looking at clinical risk stratification tools and um, specifically how we incorporate some of these wider determinants of health. And I have just um, published hot off the press a paper that starts to look at this issue and which has been accepted for publication in BMJ Respiratory Open and will be out in the next sort of 14 days. Uh, and I hope that that will be a start to what will become a national programme of work, looking at this very issue in, in a lot more detail to support frontline allied healthcare professionals and clinicians um, to, with the, the tools they need on the frontline to minimise health inequalities and improve our understanding of health inequalities and how we factor that into our decision making process, our clinical pathways, and our discharge and flow capacity through hospitals across the country. Fabulous, Marina, thank you. And I think you've answered in that um, one, one of the other questions, which is about how we make sure that we're focusing our services based on need rather than demand, um, which is a, clearly a very important point. Uh, so, John, I'm going to come to you with, uh, with this next question, if that's all right, which is uh, from Anne, and it's linked to how confident um, you are um, about extracting the AHP contribution to a kind of a multidisciplinary approach to uh, to health inequalities, recognising that sometimes it's difficult to see kind of where the specific impact is from a particular profession. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and so the, the review that we did was over about maybe ten weeks, and we just looked at um, um, there was a review of reviews. Uh, so you know, you know, I, I don't think we necessarily picked up. Um, the contribution that they make within multidisciplinary teams, for example, within secondary care settings. Uh, but I think that'd be an interesting uh, place to look at. It did come up in the, um, I guess, in the discussions and the more of the um, commentary type articles about the contribution that um, AHP's made, but we, we didn't find much evidence for that. Um, and it wasn't a strong theme. I'm not saying that's not important, but it just wasn't a strong theme in the, in the literature. And maybe that reflects um, where more research is, is, is needed. Great, thank you. I'm, co I'm conscious this may be, need to be our last, um, our last question, even though I'm conscious we won't have necessarily got through all of them. Um, but but it's, it's kind of an interesting one and one that keeps coming up and I'm, I'm thinking you might all want to have a comment in relation to this, which is um, how do we um, evidence the contribution that AHPs have made or clinicians more generally make to um, improving health inequalities, recognising that it's things over a long term and it's not and 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 it's kind of a contributory factor that any intervention that we make to a, a, a broader picture. Now, you may not have an answer to that because that is almost like the sixty four million dollar question, isn't it? But um, which which of you would like to come in first on that? If you pop your hand up in a second, John, thank you. Um, so, so I would make um two 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 quick points one is um going back to this point about how we get much smarter about what we mean you know if, if we if we just take health inequalities as a broad nebulous concept and it's very difficult for us to show impact but actually if we nail down into what we're um, what we're trying to change and how we're going to change it i think that'll take a i'll be much more meaningful plus i think there's another, another question actually is inequalities the right con concept conceptual framework we want to use is it just about helping people in crisis and helping uh, people who face hard um, hard times and actually showing that impact rather than trying to frame it as this difference between two groups, which tends to get complicated and harder to prove? Really good, really good point. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, Dirk and Marina, either of you wanting to come in on that one particular conscious? We've got one minute left. Um, Dirk. Yeah, so I guess with that question, as with the whole framework, the key is to make it manageable. Um, it can feel really overwhelming, but we're in a um, system, an era of system leadership, which means that instead of aiming for perfect, I'd start with where, where you are, find bite-sized action, actionable chunks and grow it from there. And remember that this is a collective ambition, so you yourself will not need to solve it all, but in, you know, just see that the links across, because as a team, across all of us, I think that's where the power to make a difference lies. Thank you, thank you. So 
I'd like to thank Dirka, John and Marina for participating in the um, in the webinar. It's been really great. Thanks to all of you for the, the fantastic questions that you've asked and sorry we didn't get a chance to answer all of them, but I think we've probably covered um, most of them. Thanks to Steph, Magatu and Kelly for their support behind the scenes. And then just to um, to flag to colleagues, Dirk mentioned um, all of the other case studies that we um, that we collected for this work. So those are housed on the AHP hub on the Royal Society for Public Health uh, website. There's some there already and there's more coming. So do uh, check that out. And if you'd like to be kind of involved in this conversation going forward, because we would love to hear more from you. Um, we've got a tweet chat on WeHPs on the uh, 29th of this month at eight o'clock. So we'd love it if you could join us there. So thanks again to our speakers and thanks again to you for joining.